This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 291 was recorded on September 30th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Joining me as a first-time feature interview guest this week is Yeroon Blockland, founder of True Insights. We'll discuss inflation, the Fed's dot plot, and where interest rates are headed, portfolio allocations, and much more. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment, when we'll be joined by mining industry veteran David Garofalo. We'll discuss the financialization of the gold mining industry and changes to its capital formation process. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, let's get to the S&P 500. It, uh, the rally didn't stick and the distribution's back. Uh, what's your take on what's going on in the markets here? Well, I'm going to tentatively change my tune this week, Patrick. For the last few weeks, I've been saying, yeah, I think they're going to buy this dip. You know, this was obviously brought on by the taper announcement, but everything else we've seen recently has been markets have just shrugged things off. Well, first of all, if we actually go back to the history of previous tapers, the market always shrugs it off after the Fed comes in to rescue the market, after the market has had its little taper tantrum, which I guess we haven't had enough of a tantrum yet. Particularly, though, it was really a a battle between the 100-day moving average and then the shorter moving averages, which were descending on top of it. And the question was, which one's going to hold? Already midday, we're we're taping this before the close on Thursday, but we're well below that 100-day moving average of 43.38 on the S&P. We're all the way down at 43.12 on S&P futures as we're speaking around 12.30 on Thursday afternoon. If we close down here, it really is, I think, uh, more of a significant uh, negative signal for the S&P. You've been watching this closely with your members, Patrick. What do you make of this? Well, uh, you know, on the surface, you definitely have distribution coming in here on the S&P. But what's particularly interesting was uh, the the jump in rates, which we'll talk about in a moment. But when with that uh, came a pretty clear sector rotation. And we're seeing a, a, a substantial amount of pressure on the NASDAQ and FANGs and a lot of the non-profitable tech names and particularly rate-sensitive bond proxies uh, like the utils uh, and REITs, which are all under pressure here. Here, and that money is uh, finding its way into things like financials. But bottom line is, is these market cap behemoths, if we're seeing some sort of a, a, a new set rotation out of the fangs, uh, that in itself will continue to pressure the market cap weighted indices. And so it'll be really interesting to see whether we'll see an outperformance of the, uh, the uh, equal weight S&P versus the, the market cap weighted ones. But certainly the fang selling is not a good sign on the short term and market, it seems quite vulnerable here at this stage. Anyway, Eric, let's uh, move on to the dollar and uh, obviously a big breakout here. And that's very much in line almost with like a risk off impulse here with the uh, dollar index now north of 94. I mean, we're still in that much bigger trade range, but certainly dollar strength here. What's your take on this? Well, Patrick, as you said, now we're finally seeing the breakout. I've been saying for months now, look, folks, we're still in the consolidation range. We haven't seen a signal yet. Now I think we've got the signal. The problem is the top of this consolidation range hasn't been a really clear and obvious line. And exactly where that is, I'm not really sure. So is this really a breakout per se? It feels like it to me, but I think we need to see another week and and really see if this is a trend change. It does make sense to me, though, that we would be seeing dollar strengthening in this environment. And, uh, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Well, let's move on to crude oil. What's interesting here is that uh, we had, at least at the start of this morning, a bit of a dip and uh, like like it was a little exhaustion correction. Uh, but here at the this afternoon when we're recording, we're back in the green and uh, oil seems to continue to be accumulated. It's bucking the trend off uh, from the other assets that seem to be going risk off. Uh, are you still uh, just as bullish on oil here? 
Absolutely, Patrick. I'm extremely bullish here. And the reason that you're seeing this little hiccup in the market is simply that we're, we're bumping up against the previous July high, which is only you know, about 20 cents above yesterday's high and about a dollar above where we're trading right now on Thursday afternoon. Well, why did we get such a pullback? It looked like the market really wanted to break out above that previous high. Well, okay, we got to that point, and then came EIA inventory. Crude oil was expected to draw down, but it ended up building 4.7 million barrels. Cushing, Oklahoma had a drawdown, but it was only a de minimis 131,000 barrels, and we didn't get any help from the finished products either. Gasoline building 193,000 barrels, distillates building 385,000 barrels. So builds across the board when drawdown were expected. Of course, that's a bearish signal. The market had been challenging, you know, trying to break through a very clear resistance level. They call it resistance for a reason. So we got a pullback, and that pullback took us down almost to the 13-day moving average. Very classic textbook move. And we're seeing now strength Thursday afternoon. I think probably next week we'll see that breakout above the previous cycle high at 76 spot 98. And I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of next week we're above 80. Now, it sounds like, well, wait a minute, you know, are we really going to move to new cycle highs? There's that, is that being too optimistic? Look, the other products are already at new cycle highs. Brent has moved above its July high. Gas oil has moved above its July high. Heating oil has moved above, above its July high. WTI and Arbob Gasoline are the laggards, and I think they're about to catch up. And when they do break to above the July level, I, I think that's likely to accelerate. So who knows? Frankly, I, I'd like it if we saw some more consolidation before that breakout happens to, to fuel an even bigger breakout. But we're moving higher, no doubt in my mind. All right. Well, let's talk uh, gold because uh, gold just seemed like it couldn't get out of its own way. Just distribution seemed persistent. And yet uh, today we see a, a very distinct reversal. And what's interesting about today's update, it's not that it was $37 or like a 2% move, but it, really uh, we wiped out two, three days of selling in one fluid up motion. Now, there, we haven't seen a new uptrend. We haven't broken moving average lines. We haven't broken uh, trend lines. But uh, one big reversal candle. What's uh, what's your take? Is uh, this change your mind in any way in, on on gold on the short term? Well, as you say, today looks like a reversal candle. It's an engulfing outside candle. Uh, you know, it's a, it looks very very encouraging, but still. All it did was get us back up to the eight-day moving average. It didn't even get us above all of the, the short-term moving averages. And what we've seen, how many times in a row now, going back for the last several months, is every time gold looks like it's about to break out above that cluster of moving averages, it gets right to the hairy edge. And we had one case where it was a, a clear one-day fake breakout above it, and then it just ends up tumbling over and falling down to the next level again. So, Patrick, right now, as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon, I'm looking at uh, December gold futures trading at 1759. If they could get back up above 1800 and particularly above 1815, where the 100-day moving average is, then I'd really start to get excited. And 1833 would be the, the previous resistance level above that. And I think it's definitely a, a big move above. We've only seen the very first sign of it. And frankly, all the other signs are bearish. So the next few days are really going to be telling. All right. Well, let's uh, touch on the uh, treasury yields. And what I wanted to particularly highlight here, Eric, is, is that it's uh, while the 10-year yield has certainly broken out, uh, I mean, we went from uh, in that trade range or around one spot three zero to now uh, 1.5%. So it was a, a meaningful pop in the 10-year. But we have the two-year yield and the five-year yield both uh, breaking to 52-week highs. And yet the 30-year yield is probably the largest laggard. So you have almost like the the ch shape of the yield curve uh, just changing where it really is the belly of the curve where it seems all the action is. But certainly uh, the bond market is sending a signal here. Oh, do you have any interpretation on what we're seeing here? Patrick, I don't have an interpretation and certainly not one in the nuanced detail that you're speaking to about the shape of the curve. My, my general reaction is so far what we've seen, you know, I think that the move from 130 to 150, I'm not sure really what drove that, but I don't think anybody's really going to worry about it that much. It's when you go past 170 that it seems to be the line in the sand where people freak out and start to think that the, 
the bond market is crashing. Uh, I, I think we need to see whether or not we test that level again and how the market reacts. Until we get there, I'm not too worried about it. This week's feature interview guest is founder of True Insights, Jeroen Blocklin. Eric, why did we invite Jeroen on the show this week? Well, Patrick, we've been trying to get more new guests that we haven't had on the show before, and particularly people in other geographies uh, in this case. Jeroen is in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. So we wanted to get the European perspective and kind of uh, broaden out to some, some new guests, and he'd been requested by several of our listeners. Eric's interview with your own Blockland is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was brought to you by Abex, a fintech company traded under ticker symbol ABXXF on the OTCQX in the United States and ABXX on the Equitas Neo in Canada. Abex was founded on the principle of creating market-based solutions to solve the world's most challenging problems. Two of these issues in particular, the energy transition and climate change, are creating once-in-a-generation opportunities for investors. Abex is leveraging proprietary Web 3.0 technologies to digitize and accelerate the velocity and security of commodity trading markets, beginning with liquefied natural gas and carbon. Investors seeking exposure to the fintech applications powering this new era of the ESG economy can visit www.abex.tech or www.abex.exchange or check out ABXX on the Equitas Neo or ABXXF on the OTCQX exchanges. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Jeroen Blockland, who is founder and head of research for True Insights, a new investment research platform focused on multi-asset investors around the globe. Jeroen has produced a fantastic slide deck to accompany today's interview. Registered users will find the download link in your Research Roundup email. Now, if you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you're not registered yet at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, look for the button that says looking for the downloads at macrovoices.com. Jeroen, as we dive into this, I'm really excited to get you in the program. Being in Rotterdam, you've got obviously a European perspective. Our Federal Reserve has been telling us over on this side of the pond that, hey, don't worry, this inflation stuff is just transitory. It's not going to last. What's your take on inflation? Where is it headed? What does it mean? Yes. Well, thank you for having me and uh, to get right into the, uh, the topic of inflation, which is, of course, uh, on everybody's minds. So basically, you have these, these two angles to look at it. First, you look at these mainly the three big components that add to inflation in recent months, the used cars, airfares, and hotel rates. And you see that they have peaked. So the year-on-year -year change on these items is still very large. But for example, used cars, they fell in price 1.5% in August. So from that angle, I think most central bankers are, are pretty convinced that the inflation is, is transitory is still uh, alive and well. And also, if you look at page nine of the slide deck, if you look at the flexible versus sticky CPI, and this is calculated by the Atlanta Fed, you see there in the chart that the core sticky CPI is actually not much higher than the long-term average. And also, if you look at it from 2015 onwards, it's actually in the middle of what it has been. So if you argue that this is only about flexible prices. And again, used cars, prices, airfares, and hotel rates are in that category, of course. Then you can say inflation is transitory. And also you see in this chart that even the flexible component is coming down a bit. So from that standpoint, you could argue it is transitory. And I think also you should take into account that over the last 10 years, me included, we have thought of higher inflation many times, but it never came. And, and this is because mainly there are uh, some big deflationary forces at work, globalization, technology, and so on. And so the odds are also against you. Uh, and I think the base case of the Fed, yeah, their odds are, are more favored. Having said that, there are a couple of indicators that point to 
continuously or longer than expected uh, higher inflation rates and perhaps not 5% or 6%, but maybe a longer time in above 3% or even 4%. A couple of these things I want to mention is first, if you look at inflation indicators, so the ISM prices paid index, uh, it's close to 80, that is down from 90, but it's still historically high. If you look at the latest uh, Empire State Survey, the prices received component is at a record high, and it has a, a very strong uh, relationship with, among others, the core PCE, one of the favorite inflation indicators of the Fed. And two other things I would like to highlight first is owner's equivalent rent, and you can see that on page eight of the slide deck you see there is a clear relationship obviously between owner's equivalent rent and house prices well we got another uh, data point on house prices uh, just today eh? so house prices are up almost 20 percent and this is what the uh, green line shows and you can also see that owner's equivalent rent they take about 18 months to catch up with these housing price appreciation and that means that from now and, and let's say 12 months, it is very achievable that this owner's equivalent rent component of the CPI basket will rise to above 4%. Now, it has a weight of 25%, so you can do the math. Head. So this will be a upward pressure on inflation for at least another 12 months, unless the whole US housing market uh, collapses. And that is not the case. I think we are close to the peak, uh, but it, it won't collapse immediately. So this is also a thing to take into account. And finally, and that's on page seven, there's also a thing called the medium price rise. And this is just the middle of the whole range of the whole US CPI basket. And you take the middle price increase. And in August, that was 0.34%. And you can see by the arrow, that was the biggest increase, uh, monthly increase we had since February 2007. You can also see that the month before that, July, 0.3% was also relatively high. So the median price level, I think something that uh, central bankers would also look at, is increasing at a faster pace than we have seen for a long time. And I think if you add these things together, and the fact that we are seeing supply chain disruptions getting worse and not less, they're actually getting worse, that while not perhaps 5 or 6%, but, but that we see clearly above average inflation for, let's say, the next 6 to 12 months, I, I think that is, uh, that is uh, the odds of that are, are not low. And that is why we have a somewhat more nuanced stance on this whole uh, inflation is transitory narrative. Now, let's suppose that you're right and that there is more inflation than central bankers are currently reassuring us that there's going to be. I'm not sure that means that they don't believe there's any inflation coming. They, I think they've, they're bluffing a little bit. But what happens? Let, let's suppose that you're right and it turns out six or 12 months from now that the inflation wasn't transitory and suddenly they just can't uh, you know, keep pretending it's not there. What do you expect in terms of policy response at that point? Yeah, that is, of course, the big question, because what Powell has done until so far is, is, is being very explicit about his and the Fed's expectation on this transitory. And even today, other central bankers, Lagarde today, she said the same thing. So they are very confident that this is transitory. And that means that it will, first of all, take a long time, is my guess, before they will act. So so. My guess is that if if inflation is higher than expected for a couple of months, they will not move. And also, uh, the last uh, CPI numbers, of course, help them uh, because uh, the, the core CPI fell below 4%, which was unexpected. So the, the whole narrative lifts for at least another amount, you could say. But that and so at, at some point, my guess is that you will see this ending up in the dot plot. So... So far, what Powell has done, I think, a pretty good job is to split the fact that they will taper, because that is one thing, but the threshold, as they say, for rate increases is much, much higher. And I think that the dot plot, uh, which is updated every three months, of course, in the end will provide more clues that some of the FOMC uh, members are taking this whole, it is not so transitory, into account by lifting their uh, uh, dots. And this is also the point, if you look at the dot plot, which is shown on page uh, six, 
you see it's it's very benign. Hè? So in 2024, the average or the median forecast for the Fed target rate is 1.75%. That means by then it still implies negative real yields because the inflation expectation of the Fed are uh, above 2% in each of the forecasting years. So my guess is that once FOMC members are starting to leave this transitory ID, that they will uh, reflect that by increasing uh, for the years 2023 and 2024, they will increase their dots. And that will be, then be the first clue that the markets uh, get. And I also think that markets will struggle when these uh, medium targets go up significantly. I want to talk about the supply chain disruptions that we've seen as a result of the pandemic, because frankly, if you think you know, kind of intuitively, you'd expect that those supply chain disruptions would be worst in the beginning, right? When the pandemic hits and nobody saw it coming and you know, everything's thrown out of kilter. Then, you know, after a little while, you'd expect things to kind of get under control and those supply chain disruptions wouldn't be an issue anymore. It almost feels to me like this history is playing backwards, that the supply chains were not really as disrupted as I expected them to be back in 2020. But it seems like now we're starting to get a lot of things where people are just saying, yeah, we don't really have a good plan for what we're going to do about, you know, the, the lack of widgets in order to finish building whatever it is. Lots of things that have been put on hold because one component is not available and nobody's sure when it's coming. Where is this all headed? Yeah, good question. And also, I think a very good reflection of what is happening. So for Supply chain dis disruptions, there is always the case, you can always say this is transitory because if prices go high enough, then supply will react, right? So so the, the thing is that why is this not happening now? And, and I think that in some areas, and, and, and today I think the energy complex is a good example of that, that it reflects not only what happened during the COVID-induced shock, but also uh, underinvestment in certain areas. And of course, energy is one of the biggest examples because of this whole sustainability drive. Yes. So, so I think it also the swift response of policymakers, both fiscally and monetary, uh, also the, the massive speed of the recovery now uh, reveals this longer term investment trend or, or is 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 reflected now in those uh, in those numbers at least that is that is what i uh, think we should also take into account of course that uh, supply and demand have been distorted uh, so what you said uh, i would have, have expected this earlier we have had had covid related setbacks of course uh, that that in some areas we had new restrictions uh, mobility restrictions lockdowns and things like that uh, so there was always a a, a period uh, where demand also was uh, limited for a while before getting onwards. And now that most of the bigger economic blocks are open or almost open, you see that this is all coming together. And, and on your question, where does it lead us? So I think we have to take into account, and, and, and this, was, this is for a long time not my base case, but that you will see an, an energy crunch potentially. In, in any case, the odds of this happening are rising Pretty quickly, if you look in Europe and you look at electricity prices and natural gas prices, the, these are going to the roof. And also in the chip industry, already it, it's now said that for months, for months, not weeks, but for months, these delivery times uh, will impact the global economy. Uh, so also uh, Goldman Sachs, they, they suggested that no less than 169 industries have been negatively impacted by the, by the delivery times. Uh, car uh, manufacturers, uh, so it's now estimated that they will produce 7.7 .7 million less cars than anticipated and they will lose this year a, a combined sales of, of more than 200 billion. And the thing is, and this is why the upcoming uh, earnings season will be so important. Until now, all of these companies have said, we'll make up for that later. But I'm wondering if they can say that now because of the widespread impact of these uh, supply chain disruption. I think it's very difficult for Volkswagen, for example, who have said that, that they will make up for these, the lost production in this year and maybe even the first quarter. And then the thing is that if you have a price to sales that is record, record high, I think that could be a moment when uh, equities uh, start to struggle because investors have to, yeah, they are not convinced that 
this catch-up will be in a couple of weeks or months, but perhaps it will take uh, some quarters. And I think that will be a big test for equities investors, given where price-to-sales ratios are, and these are very, very high. Let's talk about what's going on in the stock market generally. We've seen finally a little bit of weakness in the last few days, but you know, until then, despite this whole pandemic, we've basically been just new all-time high after new all-time high. What's going on? Is the market just looking beyond this, or why is the sentiment so bullish given what's going on in the world? Yeah, so the sentiment was extremely bullish, and now we have started to struggle. Uh, so I think one reason why we have seen these drawdowns and they are shown on page 12 uh, so the u.s equity so the s&p 500 index it has seen four episodes of a four percent drawdown before recovering quickly as of today and we are down two percent we are back again at that four percent level and until so far the, the recovery was rather swift i have my doubts if this is going to be the case this time but what we have seen until very recently, and that is on page 13, just as an example, there have been massive, massive flows into equities. And if you look at this chart, and no other calendar year comes even close to what is being put into equities this year. Unless you want to be seriously underweight, you have to invest these kinds of amounts. So there has been this driving force from flows and also in the whole Tina narrative, there is no alternative to equities driven by this massive uh, liquidity boost there is. Also, what we have seen until so far is that earnings per share numbers have increased dramatically. So every time you could hold up this story, okay, but companies are growing in these lofty valuations. Earnings growth is 50% year on year. Growth is still accelerating. So you, you could get away with this whole, there is no alternative and, and everything is fine. I do think that if you look at, uh, coming back to the previous topic of the supply chain disruptions, things are changing a little bit because how temporarily is this? Inflation, the same story. How, how temporary is it? Is it really? Even some of the central bankers are, are starting to discuss this a little bit. So if I look at some of the uh, data that, that, that we look at, like momentum, and also uh, the US dollar index, uh, the moving averages, it does seem that sentiment is finally weakening a bit. And yeah, if you add to that, that in an, since 1980, the medium drawdown uh, of the S&P 500 is 11% and only two years since 1980 were less than 4%. Yeah, it, it's not that unlikely that we see a bigger uh, drawdown coming. And, and, and I think this will be the biggest test we have seen so far. I do not rule out that we go back again, but, but it, it does look a little bit less confident than before. And the driver for it looking less confident, is that mostly because of the taper announcement or is it something else that's driving that change in sentiment? If you look at the price action today, I really think that this supply chain disruption leads to a higher cost or inflation, less production in a time when the economy is already cooling, which, which could be, have been expected, of course. Uh, uh, I, I also think that this is an important factor that the visibility for sales and earnings is becoming less. And I think that worries investors as well. I don't think that the tapering on itself is that important. Uh, first of all, if you look at the stock of liquidity, that remains extremely large. So the flow will go a little bit, will be, become a little bit less. But if you look at other parts of the world, and so the ECB, for example, they also want to end their, their emergency program, PEP, but they already are talking about adding to their regular program, APP. Uh, in China, you should expect more liquidity because what they did on the regulatory clampdown, the whole China Evergrande uh, thing, but also if you look at economic data. So so I think it, it, it's more the, the, the cloudiness that we have not seen for a long time. It was always clear, earnings are recovery. We just don't know by how much, but it's very strong. Uh, valuation will go down and liquidity and central banks are relatively quiet. So, But, but I, I also think that it is more difficult where next for equities given these valuations. Jeroen, let's, let's take a look at page 11, where you've got your balanced global multi-asset portfolio. I'm curious about a couple of things. Obviously, you've got a very strong equity allocation. As a professional crude oil trader, I can't help but having my feelings hurt a little bit that you've only got a 3% allocation to commodities. What's going on there? 
Yeah, so maybe a, a bit of information on how we derive these portfolios because I think that is a little bit different than than perhaps other asset managers or people that, that construct multi-asset portfolios. So what we do is as a starting point, we look at the actual investable, I should add, market cap of all asset classes that are out there. And so there are two papers I use for that. They update this data every year. So every year you get an get new data and information on the uh, relative uh, size of the different asset classes. And this is our starting point. And the reason why we do that is because if you do the traditional way a mean variance optimization, I have to make all kinds of assumptions. And even then I get corner solutions and I don't want to do that. So we looked at what are the diversification benefits of a portfolio based on actual market weights, just uh, weights, just as an uh, equity index like the MSCI for example and then look at how you could tweak that but you already see that what we call the diversification benefit is really really large if you just start with this portfolio and from the tactical point of view we could add commodities or reduce it quite dramatically if we want to but but the starting point is the is the total investable market cap of the different asset classes and is that an indication that your allocation here of 2% to high yield or junk bonds, uh, are you recommending that allocation or are you just reflecting that that, that means that, that that asset class exists and has that allocation for the rest of the market? Yeah, so high yield is perhaps not the best example eh, because we are neutral on uh, high yield bonds. And that means that it will get the weight that it has in the uh, global multi-asset uh, portfolio. But for example, commodities actually has an overweight, uh, so that should make you a little bit more happier, of 1% here. So this portfolio combines the uh, starting point and that, that are the market caps of these different asset classes. And then it adds our active weights, our active positioning. So that, that is what this chart reflects. Okay. What are the other parts of the chart that have been affected or how, how has your positioning weighted or affected these, these allocations? So first of all, at this point, uh, because of the uncertainties, uh, we have been pretty close to home. Uh, but what we have in positioning terms for, for quite a while is we are long developed market equities against emerging market equities. And that is not just because of the China regulation clampdown that is going on, but also because of weaker fundamentals in general. You also see eh, that the most common way out of this COVID crisis is vaccination and emerging markets lag in that from that perspective. Also, if you look at the bond uh, side of the portfolio, eh, so we are underweight both developed market treasuries and uh, global corporate bonds. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. First of all, we do think that bond yields are artificially low because of uh, monetary policy. So if you reverse at least some of that policy, yeah, you should uh, see an upward effect. And that is exactly, of course, what we have seen in uh, the last couple of days. But also if you look at, for example, the spreads on corporate bonds, they are well below uh, 100 basis points. That leaves you with a yield, what roughly 1.6%. And with a duration of seven and a half years, they provide zero buffer against any normalization of bond yields, even if it's a, a, a little bit. Uh, so also because of these supply chain disruptions, uh, we have put the underweights, what we have put in developed market treasuries and global corporate bonds into uh, global inflation linked bonds because yeah, we think it's feasible to have some kind of inflation protection next to commodities, which also, of course, have a high risk profile uh, into your portfolio. And I think that, that, that are the main parts of our positioning. Let's talk about last week's FOMC statement and what its implications are. Is, is this a, a, a hawkish impact that we should expect and, and where is it headed? Yeah, so we, we wrote a little piece on that and uh, we say short term hawkish, long term, longer term uh, dovish. And uh, of course, the hawkish part was that, especially in the press conference, Powell made it pretty clear that there are aiming to start soon and which is most likely November with tapering and also that they are looking to end that taper around the middle of next year. And that would make it quite a bit faster than the last tapering that we have seen. And so from that, from that perspective, it looks somewhat hawkish. Uh, and also if we go back to the dot plot on, on page six, you also see 
that some of the FOMC members have brought forward their first rake high uh, to 2022, where uh, in the previous dot plot it was clearly uh, 2023. But as, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, if you look at these median target levels, so 2024, 1.75%, 2023, 1%. That means that the normalization of uh, monetary policy is extremely slow. Uh, so, so they will take a very long time before interest rates are back to levels that yeah, are, are close to what we call the neutral rate, eh, to, to not to go into that discussion. And if you also add the fact that in, in any of these forecast years, the forecast, the Fed uh, CPI forecast is above these levels, yeah, that means that you will have negative real yields for, uh, let's say, three more years. That is extremely long period. And under normal conditions, risky assets like equities, like negative yields. You get pushed out literally out of these uh, lower yielding asset classes, especially if you take inflation into account. So, so a negative real yield always means that, that the most logical way to go is higher up the risk curve, even if you don't want to. And so I think that is the somewhat more Davis part of, of the, the latest FOMC uh, statement. And, and again, Powell did, I think, a reasonably good job again by, by splitting this tapering versus rate hikes. Eh? So he wants to have a gap between the two and also make clear that they won't immediately start uh, hiking rates much faster than is now expected. Okay. So where does this actually leave us in terms of bond yields? Are they too high or too low right now? What should we expect next? Yeah, that, that is an interesting question. So we think as policy normalizes somewhat, and if inflation risk, of course, are a little bit higher than the Fed now expects, eh, because they are full on this uh, transitory uh, story, uh, yields are too low. But we also have to take into effect, uh, so we have a, a model estimate that, that takes a number of factors like unemployment and, of course, inflation, but also the term premium into account. And if we produce that model now, it actually says that currently, uh, the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield is 30 basis points too high. And, and, and a big explanation for that is this term premium. The term premium is back to zero again. It's slightly negative. While on average, you would expect on the normal conditions that this term premium, had the difference between longer yields and shorter yields, is positive because you want to have some kind of premium for having the risk of inflation and, and growth in the future, right? So th this is how it normally should work. Again, we, we believe that this the uncertainty about growth and inflation are not low, especially on the inflation side. So there should be a positive term premium. Uh, and as the Federal Reserve starts to uh, wind down its, its, its bond purchases, we also think that the term premium should tend towards its longer term Efforts maybe not 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 immediately, and 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 if you if if you take into account that that could normalize, then bond yields are too low. But I don't think that unless these supply chain disruptions make the inflation uh, headline inflation spike again from these levels which are already elevated, that will we be moving above two percent immediately. But but yeah, the base case is up, but gradually. Jeroen, let's talk about China Evergrande, the property developer in China. It seems like maybe the accounting for this, I guess, the, the largest property developer in the world was, well, you know, it's China. Nobody's really paying attention. What happened here? What does it mean? Some people are saying this is the Lehman moment that could bring about the next global financial crisis. How big of a deal is this really? And, and particularly with respect to contagion. Yeah, that, that, that of course, is the biggest uh, question because in itself – we should assume because it is very difficult to know exactly what is happening there, not only because it's China, but also in the Lehman event that you that you mentioned. We all, most people also didn't know exactly what was going on, right? It, it, it is very complex. But so it is about a contagion because in itself, if the Chinese authorities want to end it, this they, they can do that. They have ample room to do that. So I think the best thing is, indeed to look at indicators that reflect any potential 
uh, contagion because we don't know if Evergrande is going to pay uh, the next outstanding coupon. Hey, they missed one. There's a grace period of 30 days. I think a Sunday they have another one. It's it's very complicated. You have these authorities that say you have to fix it and then the company itself, you don't hear anything about it. Hey? So, so obviously there is something uh, wrong there, but we don't know exactly what. So a couple of things that we could look at, and the first is on page three, uh, that is in China's debt market. And here you see a chart showing the uh, high yield spread, that is the blue line, which has spiked massively. Uh, two thirds of the China high yield index are property developers. So, so there's a big concentration of real estate in that index. But if you look at the investment grade spread, which is the green line, it hardly moved. And in that index, property developers have a much uh, lower weight. So from this angle, I would say little contagion so far. Also, in the last couple of days, the Chinese central bank, uh, the PBOC, has added liquidity. And that also means that if you look at interbank rates, and that's also what we did during the Lehman period, they are well behaved. Huh? And, and this is exactly, of course, what the Chinese uh, government wants by injecting the liquidity. But we also see that interbank rates are, are still uh, relatively uh, low. Another, I think, more global indicator to look at is the Chinese currency, which is on page uh, four. And we have seen a couple of times in the last, let's say, five to 10 years that whenever the Chinese yuan started to depreciate quite significantly and also quite swiftly that a risk of sentiment entered the market. Now, we saw on the Monday that markets went down quite a lot because of this whole how much contention will there be uh, issue. It, it depreciated a little bit, roughly half a percent, but you can see on the chart on page four, After that, it has made up for some of that uh, depreciation and it's very close to the strongest level in years. So also from the currency perspective, it seems at least for now that these contagion risks are not that high or not that persistent yet. Uh, the last thing, I think that also why it won't be a Lehman, uh, so I, 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 I don't think it will be a Lehman uh, event because of the capacity of the Chinese government uh, to fix it in a good or a bad way, but uh, they, they can do something and, and perhaps nationalization would be one of the options. I also think that the odds of real big contagion effects are limited because of what is happening in China themselves. So if you look, a lot of companies, they have found, let's say, alternative ways of debt creation yeah, because credit growth was restricted by the, by the Chinese government. Uh, so they created all of these funds or they, they put out loans through these funds. And, and the thing is that a lot of uh, Evergrande employees, uh, they actually invested in those trust funds. Now, if you also look at the retail sales, of course, also because of a partial lockdown, it was very low. I think the threshold for the Chinese government to have a very painful and messy uh, default is not extremely high. So I also think that from that angle, protecting its own consumers and workers, that, that they will find a solution. That does not mean, of course, that contagious risks are zero, and we have seen uh, last week. Uh, so I, I do think this is a, a somewhat binary uh, effect that if, you, if this drags on for too long, it will again hit markets, but I don't think it will be a Lehman style impact. Going back to page 11, you mentioned before that you really source this from all of the assets that exist in markets. I notice you don't have the, the newfangled one, which is Bitcoin on here. What's your take on the role or non-role of cryptocurrencies in, uh, in professionally managed portfolios? Yes, excellent question. So, We looked at it and um, I think one thing we want to make clear is that we do acknowledge the potential of Bitcoin as some kind of digital gold. So maybe not exactly the same, but, but I, I can imagine that investors see the potential of Bitcoin in, in, this, in this way. So having said that, so, so that also means that it has some value. We can have a long discussion about monetary value or intrinsic value. But yeah, monetary, a lot of asset classes have monetary value. Art has monetary value. And it has no intrinsic value. So, so I, for me, that is not that, that relevant. The thing is though, so 
if we would take the current market cap of Bitcoin, it would have a weight of 0.5, 0.6% in this portfolio. The thing is that immediately you have to do some of the things in a multi-asset context a, a bit differently. And so for example, because of this massive volatility, so a lot of um, Bitcoin proponents, uh, they say, okay, it's great because it has a correlation of zero with every other asset class. And that in itself is not a bad thing. But because Bitcoin has a realized volatility of 100%, which is more than five times higher than equities, the next biggest, uh, riskiest asset, you get all of this risk into your portfolio. So what we are thinking about, and, th- and this is something uh, as you, uh, so True Insight has just started and, and we're also looking at it. But what we do want to make clear is that if you add it, uh, we, we can imagine that you add it, but you have to be very aware of the risk return profile that brings. And also that, for example, rebalancing your portfolio has to be done much more often uh, than in this regular, uh, let's say regular, but more traditional asset classes. Eh? So so I think the whole asset management industry, multi-asset energy, we have to think about, okay, how are we going to incorporate this without having it dominating all of the portfolio characteristic. And I think that at this point is a challenge. So if you stick with half a percent, I think with, with some yeah, very rigid monitoring, it could work out. But if you if you want to add that because you're positive to 5%, then the whole risk return trade-off that you that you aim for by having a multi-asset portfolio, uh, yeah, that goes out of the window. And I, I, I think that is an important aspect to take into account. Uh, having said that, uh, I do think that there is, there is a potential for Bitcoin as some kind of digital gold-like. Uh, well, Jeroen, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about what you do at True Insights and how people can follow your work if they want to find out more. Thanks. Yeah, so True Insights is an independent investment research platform which has been newly created. And what we offer to investors around the glo- globe, both retail and professional investors, is, is we enable them to construct well diversified multi-asset portfolios like you uh, see on slide 11. Uh, so so we have done a lot of the work for you, let's so to say. And I, I think it, it, it is pretty difficult to come up with a balanced portfolio, a well diversified portfolio. Uh, what, what kind of choices do you have to make? Now, as I explained on this chart, uh, we look at the, the total market cap of investable uh, asset classes. The second is... And that is what we talked about uh, for most of the time is uh, that that our research that we provide enables investors to capitalize, as we call it, on market developments. Uh, so basically, we offer tactical asset allocation or asset class views, as we call them, to enhance your portfolio uh, risk return uh, profile. Uh, so by tweaking these weights a little bit, uh, we, we won't go out of equities completely, of course, because we, we stick to this well-diversified portfolio, but by adding to equities or, or reducing equities, uh, we want to uh, uh, increase the return or also the risk-adjusted return, uh, if you want it in a technical uh, uh, phrase. And uh, yeah, the way we do that, that is we offer uh, three different memberships, which you can find on the website, one that suits you. And, and basically, after that, we do the work for these investors. And, and, and we hope, of course, that they will use and can use our research uh, to build these portfolios themselves and also to adjust them based on the current market developments. And, and, that, and that is basically what the core of what we do. Your room, we look forward to getting you back for an update in a few months. Patrick Serezna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Escrow.com is the payment system for buying and selling anything of value. Cars, boats, airplanes, jewelry, gemstones, fine art, collectibles, intellectual property rights, domain names, bringing in shipping containers from overseas, or even buying and selling entire businesses. It's simple to use. Either party sets up the transaction. Then the buyer sends the funds to escrow.com. The seller is then instructed to send the goods to the buyer to inspect. Within the inspection period, the buyer can return the items for any reason. After that, Escrow.com pays the seller immediately. Escrow.com is the world's most secure payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. 
over 2 million customers have transacted over $5 billion on escrow.com. And eBay and Shopify use it for cars, boats, luxury watches, and business sales. It's available in the United States, Canada, and Australian dollars, euros, and British pounds. Never buy or sell anything online unless you use escrow.com. Escrow.com is a subsidiary of Freelancer.com, listed on the OTCQX Best Markets under the ticker symbol FLNCF and the Australian Securities Exchange under the ticker FLN. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, great interview with Yarun. Now we have mining industry veteran David Garofalo joining us for the post-game interview. Eric, I'll let you explain why we added this segment to introduce David. Well, Patrick, David has been a mind builder for his whole career of 30 years. From Agnico Eagle, he was a CFO for 10 years, to Hud Bay, which is Canada's second largest miner, to Gold Corp, uh, which is the, the world's third largest gold producer. What's on my mind, though, is not that history, but why is a guy like David, who is all about building mines and knows how to do it and is very well respected for that, not building mines? I see this trend where the smartest guys in the room are all focusing on creating companies to do this royalty streaming business model. So, David, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you on the program. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Let's get into what's going on because you know the way that that capital formation used to occur for gold mining companies is they would basically go through a broker or a guy like our friend Marin Katusa who organizes these financings. You get a bunch of accredited investors together to invest in an early financing round. That's the way you get the money to go and build your gold mine. It seems like this royalty and streaming model has kind of change the game. Why is it, you know, you, you've got obviously one of the, the most impressive resumes in the industry. You're not going and building any more gold mines. You're creating this gold royalty corporation instead. Why is that? What, why are the smartest guys in the room changing horses, so to speak? Well, the interesting part of the royalty business, it actually complements mine building. Um, it's an important part of the ecosystem and that it provides access to capital for the emerging producers and developers and explorers to get more cost-effective financing to build up their mines. And the reason I switched horses from mine building and operations to financing mine construction by providing capital and taking royalties back is because of the significant underinvestment that's occurred in the mining business and new mine development over the last six or seven years. There's going to be uh, a significant movement of capital into new mine development over the coming years, but that's against a backdrop of significant inflation in the general economy. And because of the lack of investment and need for the industry out of existential necessity to actually invest in new mine development, there's gonna be a rush of capital. It's gonna inflate input costs. And the royalty business provides you leverage to the commodity, leverage to exploration success, but completely insulates you from operating in capital cost inflation because it's top line exposure entirely. Okay, so from an investor standpoint, I love the idea that by investing in a royalty company, essentially you're insulating me from this inflation cost. If I bought the, the mining shares, the mining company is going to have to face inflation in coming years in terms of their, their operating costs. You're kind of insulating me from that, which is great. But I also have to kind of think, wait a minute, this new model has completely changed the capital formation process. It used to be that, that accredited investors like me got kind of a sweetheart deal from what I think is an injustice in the regulations. It, these accredited investor rules don't make any sense. But what they do is they say, guys like me get these sweetheart deals on private placements in companies before they go public. It seems to me that if I invest in a royalty and streaming company like yours, David, I'm kind of creating a middleman between me and, and I'm a, if I'm the capital provider and the company is the capital consumer, I'm putting you in the middle between us. And I suppose if you're doing something more efficiently than I could do it, maybe it's a better deal for both parties. But I, I always get a little bit skeptical when middlemen get involved. How should I think about the role that you play in potentially changing the access that, that I have to private placements? You know, it's an excellent question. What I would say is, again, we insulate you from the operating capital costs. So if you're an accredited investor investing in a new mining venture, 
you're going to be exposed to technical risk, capital cost risk, uh, and inflation. And with a royalty company, you're going to be insulated from that. The other element that we offer you is I have a very deep management and board that have been building and operating mines for decades. So we do all the heavy lifting on the due diligence side for you. Anything we're investing in, we have a high degree of confidence that it's feasible, that it's going to be economic, that it's going to generate strong rates of return for you. So we we provide a diversification tool for you. We own almost 200 royalties within our combined company. So it's a, a wide diversity of royalties from early stage exploration through to production that's undergone rigorous due diligence by our strong technical and operating team. So we do a lot of that heavy lifting for you. Okay, but we're separating the royalties from the ownership. I mean, it's not like you're a fund that's going out and investing, you know, a a guy that's organized a mutual fund to go invest in gold operating companies. You're not investing in the equity of those companies. You're financing them, and you're essentially buying these royalty streams. So why is that a better way to, to do this than just owning the equity in the companies? And why wouldn't I, you know, instead just go through owning an ETF that gives me a, a broad diversified basket of different shares? Yeah. So, you know, when you're buying an operating company, you're getting exposed at operating costs, capital costs, inflation, the technical risk. You're not going to get that diversification that you would by owning a royalty company And you're going to get full leverage to the gold upside, full leverage to the exploration success. It's really the best of all worlds. It's almost like owning uh, the physical gold, but with exploration upside. You know, when you own physical gold, you don't need to worry about political risk. You don't need to worry about operating risk. You don't need to worry about input cost inflation. It's the same principle with the royalty companies, and particularly well-diversified royalty companies with well-diversified royalty portfolios. You get insulated from a lot of the underlying risks of running a mine but still get all of the upside in terms of gold price and in terms of the expiration. Okay, but I also want to understand that the effect that, you know, what you're doing in the industry and and just the size of your career and the amount of capital that you're commanding, you're changing the game here in terms of how these young gold companies get funded. And what it makes me wonder about is, is, okay, I see that there's a benefit there, but if you're going to be doing this and many of the gold operating companies are selling you these royalties in order to to, to get the, the benefit of your financing, well, that means that if I'm investing in gold mining shares, I might be investing in companies where, unbeknownst to me, I'm not really getting the benefit of upside and gold price that I think I'm getting because they've already sold you the royalty. And I might not be aware of that when I'm buying the shares. So when you buy into, or I should say, when you finance these companies and buy royalties, is the fact that you've done that disclosed to their shareholders? And do do people know that they're not really buying the whole gold company when they buy it? It is. And typically, though, we take a small slice of the top line. It's typically 1% to 3% of the revenue. So it still maintains significant upside for the shareholders of those companies. It also is an arbitrage opportunity for these smaller companies that otherwise can't access capital. Typically, they're trading a fraction of the underlying value of the business because of the inherent risk and execution risk, financing risk of bringing these projects to fruition. Typically, royalty companies, the more mature ones, are trading at one and a half, two times, and in the case of some of the bulge bracket royalty companies, three times the underlying value of their business. So they're able to raise capital at a much more cost-effective basis than their early stage producers and developers. And they're able to then deploy that capital at a higher multiple for the juniors and they can otherwise access capital themselves. It would be super diluted for them to go to the markets themselves the royalty companies provide access to capital much more cheaply. So everybody wins. It's an arbitrage gain for both companies, both the emerging producers and also for the royalty companies to get those royalties re-rated within their portfolio at a much higher multiple. Now, starting with Franco Nevada, I guess there's been a market essentially created for these royalties. You're bidding against other royalty companies in order to buy royalties from producers, right? We are, but we've also found another way to grow. Um, There's been a proliferation of royalty companies that have come into the sector the last couple of years, anticipating this new wave of mine development. But unfortunately, many of them are quite a liquid. They've they've got a decent portfolio, starter portfolio of assets, but they've been unable to grow beyond that because of their inability to access capital. They're too small. They don't have sufficient scale. Given the 
the expertise of my board, the depth of our board and depth of, of expertise and time we put into the industry, we've been able to raise capital much more readily uh, because we're known quantities. And we've gone about consolidating the space. Uh, since we IPO'd and raised $90 million US in March, we've taken over three other royalty companies that are smaller than us, and we've quadrupled our size since our IPO. And so we created scale quickly and realize a significant re-rating for our shareholders and by extension also been able to access capital much more readily for our shareholders and deploy that into new royalty opportunities. Okay. Now, when you started Gold Royalty Corp., I know that you began by consolidating, essentially, Amir Adnani's company and starting with the royalties and streams that he already had. Is there a market where all of these funds, uh, or or I should say uh, gold royalty companies like yours, uh, are acquisitive of other companies? Or is there also trading of the royalties themselves where you might say, I'm going to sell this royalty to this other gold royalty company because, you know, they value it higher than I do? It's rare to trade royalties. Um, you know, once you have them in your portfolio, even if it's a long dated opportunity, it might not be developed for years. That's that's infinite optionality. You never want to give that up. Those royalties survive bankruptcy. They're permanently adhered to the assets. So you put them on the shelf and you wait and you're patient and while you cultivate some of the near term opportunities. But, but you're right. The way to grow our business is through M&A. And we've done that. Quickly, we've gone from 17 royalties on the assets you're talking about in Amir's company, Gold Mining Inc., uh, and we've grown to 191 royalties in six months by uh, acquiring three other companies uh, of similar size to us that's allowed us to quadruple our market cap from $200 million post our IPO to $800 million after we've completed these recent mergers. And that's really opened up the markets for us. It's allowed us to re-rate our stock, drive down our cost of capital, and make us competitive for the royalty opportunities to come down the pipeline individually. David, I want to step back to the macro now. We've done a lot of analysis of precious metals on macro voices, and I think there's a strong consensus view that just, boy, look at the money printing, look at the popularity of MMT, where policy seems to be headed. So many really good reasons to be bullish gold. But you know what? The tape action's really not too impressive considering this macro backdrop, at least as I see the fundamentals. What am I missing here, and or, or why isn't gold responding as so many people think it ought to be? Well, I, I think the response actually has been there. Um, we've gone over the last several years from $1,000 gold to almost over $2,000 an ounce last year. We're settled back to about $1,800 an ounce. Nothing goes up in a straight line, but when it does go up, it tends to go up violently. And the ingredients for that have been uh, cast over the last decade. It's not a recent phenomenon. It goes really back to the credit crisis back in 2009 when there was a coordinated effort by the central banks globally to print money. And it hasn't stopped. It started then and it hasn't stopped throughout this entire period. And it hasn't started because of the pandemic. It's been in place for a number of times. It's been amplified because of the pandemic. And what I mean by that is lower interest rates for longer quantitative easing, which is basically a euphemism for printing fiat currency with reckless abandon. And what's that? what that's done is create, it created an inflationary environment, uh, dramatically inflationary, well beyond the headline CPI numbers that you've seen of 5 6%. Uh, if you bought a house, filled up your gas tank, or bought food in the last year, you're realizing double-digit inflation. And gold is an accurate barometer of inflation, and it, it goes up dramatically and quite violently when the market starts to lose confidence in those underlying fiat currencies. We saw this before in the 1970s when we had significant inflation. That was driven by oil price inflation, which infected the supply chain. This is different inflation. This is being driven by money supply, dramatic increases in money supply, but it has the same sort of potential impact. And back in 1981, we were at the peak of the inflation cycle, gold achieved 850 an ounce which doesn't seem very high relative to the $2,000 an ounce we had last year, but that's $1981. You inflation adjust that to 2021, that's $3,000 an ounce. We're not anywhere near where we think we're going to see gold in this cycle. I think we're going to see at least $3,000 an ounce. And it's not going to be a steady climb when it happens, when there's a lack of confidence in the fiat currencies, a lack of confidence in the valuations in the equity markets, which have been stretched beyond recognition and precedent there's going to be a violent upward swing in the gold price. 
I agree with you on the $3,000 price target, but now I want to ask the harder question because it's it's kind of difficult to understand the mechanics of how these royalty and streaming businesses really work. If I buy GROY on the New York Stock Exchange, that is your company that is a gold royalty investment company, I understand what the proposition is for buying gold bullion, and I understand the proposition for buying mining shares, which most people would describe as leverage to that price of gold. Tell me about the characteristics of buying the royalties. Is it something where as the price goes up, my appreciation is linear? Does it does it look more like an option where you really get a, a big kicker if you go beyond a certain price? What does it look like in terms of how it contrasts with the other ways of investing in precious metals? No, it's an excellent question. To me, it's like owning a gold bar, but with expiration upside. So you get full leverage to the commodity price without worrying about the underlying operating capital cost inflation you'd get in an operating company. And you get the full expiration upside. So if that operating partner upon which we have a royalty continues to drill out their deposit, our royalty grows because the resource grows. Our royalty is on not only the existing resource, but any growth in the resource. And it's a perpetual royalty. It will be there forever. And so as, as other operators come in and explore that property, if it's traded or, or sold, our royalty survives all of that. It's it's really infinite optionality on expiration upside and full leverage to the gold price without worrying about capital costs and operating costs or input cost inflation generally. Well, David, I want to thank you for joining us. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective, because the funds sit in escrow. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to your own uh, slide deck. You'll also find a link to a, a variant perception article on the U.S. economic outperformance supports this U.S. dollar rally and an article highlighting Charlie McElligot's views on fund flows going into the month and OPEX. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at research roundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions if you have not already follow our main twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases you can also follow eric on twitter at eric s townsend that's eric spelled with a k and myself at patrick serezna on behalf of eric townsend and myself thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. 
The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.